giving lies at the beginning of the path, and it underlies everything that we do as a practice. Mundane right view begins simply with there is giving, there is what is given. Which basically in the time of the Buddha meant two things. One, that when you give something you actually have the choice to give or not to give, and so there's merit in making the choice to give. And two, the recipient is not nothing. In other words, it's not the case that we die and just disappear and that's the end of everything. Every being keeps on going and going and going. As long as you're a being, you're going to keep on going. And so helping other beings is actually a worthwhile thing then. For millennia, the Brahmins have been teaching that giving was good, but specifically when giving to Brahmins. And you can imagine after a long period of that, people started getting cynical. And there were people actually saying that there was no virtue to giving at all. And the argument was either that everything you do is predetermined by either the stars or some creator or your past karma, so that when you actually give something, you didn't have any choice in the matter which means there's no virtue in it. Another argument was that people, when they die, just disappear or are annihilated. Since we're going to be annihilated anyhow, what virtue is there in giving anything to someone who's going to be annihilated? So the Buddha, when he started his statement of mundane right view, he started with that principle, there is what is given, to emphasize that yes, we do have freedom of choice, and to it is worthwhile to give to one another. When he gave the graduated discourse, which basically takes you from mundane right view and prepares the mind so it's ready for the Four Noble Truths, that too starts with giving. The Buddha would talk about the joy that comes with giving, because after all, it is a quality of the mind. The virtue doesn't lie in the gift so much as it lies in the attitude you bring to it, the act of giving. You realize that you could have taken that item, whatever it was, or taken the time, or taken the knowledge and kept it to yourself, whatever the object is, or whatever the quality is that you're giving. You could have kept it to yourself and enjoyed it, but it wouldn't be as nearly as deep an enjoyment as the enjoyment that comes from giving it away. You're making a statement about the value of the mind and the pleasures of the mind and the integrity and character of the mind as opposed to just a, a taste of pleasure. From that spot, then the Buddha would talk about the, the value of virtue, which is another kind of gift. You give safety to yourself and other beings. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no taking of intoxicants. You're protecting yourself, you're protecting others. And if you stick with that precept consistently, in other words, you don't hold to it only when it's convenient or when you feel like it, you hold to it no matter what. That means that your gift is universal. You give it to everybody. And because it's universal, you have a share in that universal safety yourself. From there, the Buddha would go on to talk about the rewards of heaven that come from gener generosity and from virtue. We have very few of his teachings on heaven, aside from saying that if you can imagine a king and all the pleasures of the king, and then and he would say it's not one sliver of the pleasure that comes from being in heaven. But then he would talk about the drawbacks of all that. After all, you gain the pleasure, the sensual pleasures of heaven. But then you lose them and come back down. And when you come back down, you come down hard. He says it's very rare that a deva is, passes away from one deva realm and goes to another deva realm or to the human realm. More likely they go down to the lower realms. They used up all their good karma and now they've got to start all over again. When you think about 
even divine sensual pleasures. They're there, but then they're gone. Well, think about your human sensual pleasures. The sensual pleasures you had last week, where are they now? They're gone. What's left is the karma that you made as you were trying to find those pleasures, which may have been skillful, but sometimes it wasn't. So then you're stuck with that kind of karma. And the process just keeps going around and around and around. As the Buddha said, it's like throwing a stick up in the air. Sometimes it falls on one end, sometimes it falls on the other end, sometimes it falls splat in the middle without much rhyme or reason. I mean, karma is what drives all of this, but the workings of karma can be very complex and they can come out in very unexpected ways. And we've been through this so many times. The Buddha said, you, it's very hard to meet someone who has never been your mother or never been your father or your sister or your brother or your daughter or your son. And he's saying that not to make you feel loving kindness or goodwill to all the people of the world. He says it's, it's to give rise to a sense of terror. It's just how long this has been going on and all the suffering that's been involved. And we're going to talk about this. That, at that point, then, he said, the mind is ready for the Four Noble Truths. Once you see that there is rest in renunciation, you think about the king, King Badia, who left his kingdom, became a monk, and he would sit under the tree and say to himself, what bliss, what bliss. And the other monks were concerned. They thought he was reminiscing about all the pleasures of his time as a king. So they reported this to the Buddha. The Buddha sent for Badia and asked him, what do you have in mind when you say, what bliss? And Badia says, before when I was king, I had to have guards posted inside this palace and out inside the city and out inside the country and out. And still, I couldn't sleep for fear. But now I can sleep anywhere with my mind like a wild deer. And that's the bliss. There is bliss in renunciation when you don't have to be tied down to sensual pleasures, when you find a pleasure that's better than that. So you always want to keep that in mind. This is what all the practice is all about. The practice of giving, the practice of virtue, the practice of meditation is to find that bliss that takes you out of the cycle. That doesn't require that you keep coming back and back and back. And a bliss that really is satisfying. The teachings of the Buddha are all about true happiness. One of my students was leading a workshop recently at a Chinese Buddhist temple. And she asked the monks and the nuns to say in a few words what Buddhism is all about. And they kind of looked at one another and said, well, it's all about being a good person. It's all about self-sacrifice, things like that. So she said, well, what about true happiness? And they said, oh, yeah. That's what it's all about, a happiness that doesn't let you down. The happiness doesn't harm anybody, and it can be found by training the mind to higher and higher levels of standards for what counts as genuine well-being and what counts as something that you like doing because it feels right. And it starts with generosity. It feels right to be generous. It's a higher level of pleasure, a higher level of happiness. What you're doing is becoming a connoisseur. What does real happiness consist of? What is it like? It's not just pleasures. It's not power. It's not money, wealth. It's a quality of the mind. And what activities foster that quality of the mind in a way that is really stable? The Buddha lays it all out. And all too often it's easy to get distracted by the words of the teaching to forget that this is all about happiness, true happiness. But it's a happiness that requires a fair amount of discernment. One, to find it, to take on 
the duties of the Four Noble Truths and to see that, yes, the, the problem of the suffering that we create for ourselves really is the big problem in life, and that's what we've got to tackle. A lot of people say, well, can I just be happy without having to tackle problems like that? You can get a superficial happiness that way, but it's this tendency of the mind to keep on creating suffering for itself that's always undermining all our other attempts at happiness. So we've got to focus on this and look into our cravings. We don't ordinarily like to look into our cravings. As a John Swart once said, we get things backward. We think suffering is our enemy and cravings are our friends. But actually, craving is the enemy because it's what's causing the suffering. But as a part of that technique or part of the strategy of the practice, we learn how to become friends with suffering. In other words, we get familiar with it. We don't push it away. We don't try to run away from it. We try to comprehend it. What's going on here? What's happening in the mind? And this requires that we put more effort into training the mind than we might have otherwise. But we should consider the alternatives. Just falling back to the old cycles of gaining pleasure and then getting heedless about the pleasure and then losing it and then trying to find it again and getting heedless about it again. Once you see that you had enough of that, and then you're ready to move on to something deeper and something better. To be, you're becoming more and more discerning, more and more of a connoisseur of your happiness. But it's all basically the same principle that when you have an object and you realize that you could either enjoy it yourself or you can give it to somebody else, and you realize that the pleasure, the sense of well-being that comes from giving away is better. The path starts with that, and then it refines that observation. And it'll take it into some unexpected ways, but it begins there. And of course, the final act of the path is letting go of everything. But you let go and you're not impoverished. You let go in such a way that you find more wealth in terms of a genuine happiness than you could have had otherwise. So even though we get to the goal not by focusing on the goal, but by focusing on the path, still it's good to remember every now and then where this practice is taking us. So we can practice the path with more energy and find more delight in letting go.